Welcome to the Kara's Kara's Digital Show and Podcast, where we explore the cutting edge of wellness. I'm Kara Sundlin. I'm happy you're here. This episode is sponsored by the Center for Advanced Reproductive Services. So about one in three Americans claim to experience holiday burnout between Thanksgiving and the New Year. Joining me now is Jenny Blumenthal, who is the founder of Corporate Rehab. Love that. She's also the author of the number one new Amazon release called Corporate Rehab, Ditch the Hustle Culture and Thrive Again. She is actually here now to teach us uh, how we can choose peace over pressure this year. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks so much for having me, Kara. Happy to be here. Yeah, so I it just, I'm curious, um, as, you, as you've now had this corporate experience, what inspired you to look at how we can maybe do things differently? Well, I think uh, I wrote the, this book um, called Ditch the Hustle Culture and Thrive Again based on my own experience of hitting extreme burnout in my career and listening to uh, the stories of 300 women that I gathered for the book. And that's really what inspired me to think about sharing new ways of, of living and being in our work and lives that allow us to not have to approach so much burnout. So that was really the inspiration for this change. Yeah. And you say, number one, we really need to review our boundaries. Yes, that's right. I think that's the biggest thing. And especially as women, we see that happening both at work and at home. I mean, some of the latest studies show that women put in an additional 20 hours of caregiving responsibilities at home. And so, so often we are actually walking into the workplace already pretty exhausted or depleted. And then when we come into the workplace, often it can come from several places. Maybe your work is on a, an extreme growth pattern. Uh, maybe you're in a position where you don't want to say no and appear rude. And and you've got uh, as a card carrying people pleaser my whole life. I know that was definitely me. And I think if you can think about putting boundaries in place around your time and your energy, that's really where we start to actually recover from some of that burnout. So let's start with something simple uh, that isn't easy. How do we say no? I think a lot of people, maybe especially women, have trouble with saying no. Yes, I agree. I mean, I think the, the big thing I have here is to really stay authentic. Find a phrase that works for you where you can accept the no, but then redirect a little bit. So things like, oh, I'd really love to help out with that. It'll have to wait to the new year, but I can't wait to dig in. Or we're actually going to celebrate holidays differently this year to your family. And I really appreciate you understanding how we're going to celebrate something in a different way. And so you're really setting that appropriate boundary around your time and energy, whether it's at work or at home, but doing it in a way that feels authentic to you, where you're communicating your needs and you're still getting what you need without feeling like you're appearing to be rude. Yeah. And I think, um, as people pleasers, uh, and, and that maybe used to be a badge of honor of like, I'm going to do more, I'm going to sleep less, I'm going to achieve more, right. I'm going to achieve more. Right. Um, I mean, there's there's a certain level of satisfaction we get with, look at how much I got done today. Is is that part of the problem? Yes, I think so. And in fact, in my research, when I went in to start researching in this book, what is this issue that keeps us staying in places longer or burning out, really what's happening is under the surface, uh, sometimes in our homes, sometimes in our workplaces, we've got this hustle culture, right? Whether it's to do that extra project so you can get the promotion, or maybe you're trying to hustle kids out the door to get with shoes on to get to the soccer game on time. It's this constant productivity, always on the go, that keeps us running longer and harder and faster than is really good for us. Our bodies really weren't designed that way. And so it's just an opportunity to recognize that it's the hustle culture. It might not be just you, uh, but sometimes we trap that in our bodies and we hold it in place um, much longer than it serves us. And so it's just a, an invitation to actually examine how much you're letting it drive you. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that um, with your body. You actually say it's important that we check in. How do we figure out really what's best for us? Yes. So this was an interesting thing when I started to do the interviews for my book and I spoke to all of these women, I noticed this pattern where they'd say, oh, when I was really stressed out, this other physical thing happened to me. I started losing my hair or I was rushed to the emergency room thinking I was having a heart attack. And really what was happening was our bodies show us these signals all the time 
for what's good and what's not. And so often when we're running on this hustle culture, we just ignore the signals that our bodies are telling us, whether it's physical pain or whether it's through an emotion. So I think the key lesson there is actually just stopping or getting quiet for a minute and making some time to check in with yourself, understanding where you're feeling some of those emotions and actually just getting quiet through meditation or stillness, even if it's 30 seconds before your day starts, gives you a chance to really tap in and reconnect with yourself. And it's really just practicing that change, right? Because a lot of people say, I don't have time to meditate. And others will say, well, do you have time to do the only thing that matters? Which you're talking about 30 <laughs> seconds of just recentering. Um, and uh, what would that look like? Like if someone needs to start learning these skills of setting a boundary, is this first step like I'm going to get quiet and I'm not, just not going to say yes right away? Maybe you start with I'm going to say, let me look into that. Or, or what does it look like to make these changes? Sure. So I have a couple of tips for different people because it's all different for each of us, right? For my overachiever and type A planners like myself, I actually walk people through doing a quick calendar audit of their week and look at the things that actually fueled you or drained you. It could be people, it could be situations, it could be the parts of your work that really lit you up versus what took away and really start to look at those patterns because that's the first clue as to the things that actually drain some of our energy and make us need to, you know, can constantly run on that hustle culture wheel. And then the second piece is really thinking about what do you need when those things happen? Do you need a break? Do you need a glass of water? <laughs> do you need to step away? Um, and then starting to add in the healthy habits, because what I think what happens is so often where we say, sure, I'll meditate. I'll just add that on top of the 24 hours a day I'm running hard. It's really hard to do that. So you really need to give yourself a bit of a break and start to look at the things that are actually working for you versus what's working against you before you try to add one more wellness thing to your checklist. Yeah, yeah. And for those type A people who do use a to-do list and all that, uh, but um, <laughs> I think lists help people. Some people disagree with that. But yeah. one thing I've been taught out uh, doing these interviews for years and years now, one thing that stuck with me was that I should put breathe on my to-do list. And I have to say, the days that I actually write that word, I do remember to check in with myself more, which can make a difference. Yes, that's right. And it's so interesting when you think about that, because so much of that is just the mind-body connection, even where you're giving your chance, your body a chance to reset. And what's happening is you're interrupting a stress response that's going to either make you run faster or fight or whatever it might be. You're giving your brain a chance to come online and actually respond in a way that feels better for you. So it's kind of fun how that all works together. Right. So there's the science of it. It doesn't have to be woohoo. Uh, you know, people think meditation, whatever. you can call it whatever you want, but you're actually allowing your whole brain to work. And when we're really tense, we're just we're not accessing the wisest part of ourselves. That's right. I think what happens a lot of the time is we just wind up working on autopilot. Um, and you think I think the best way to describe it, this is the way I describe it to my kids is our body is the best supercomputer ever built. And it's just running on the programs we feed it. So if we're feeding it more and more hustle, it'll keep going. If we feed it breaks and give us a chance to actually reset, it has a chance to find new pathways to actually calm down and give us a chance to kind of reset instead of react. Right. And I think for parents listening to this, they'll say, okay, that sounds great, but have you seen my house in the morning trying to get the kids out the door? And and we all fall into that of, come on, how could you not know where your shoes are again? Or, you know, and, and it can start, the mornings can start that way. I know most people will say there's a lot of pressure in the morning and, you know, that maybe that means they're not eating healthy breakfast or whatever. What do you recommend um, to start the mornings? You might start there with a better way. Yes. Well, it sounds like you might have had camera crews in my house this morning because that's usually what a parenting house with two kids looks like, especially teenagers. But I actually tried to start my day with gratitude, which has actually been found to be the one thing that really resets the neural pathways. It makes you open to receiving, which is really hard for some of us. Um, so even if I do it while I'm brushing my teeth um, or if I don't get to it before the craziness of getting out of the house, I make sure before I check in that first email, I'm actually just picking three things to be grateful for. Um, it sounds woo-woo to your point, but the science is that it actually resets a lot of those neural pathways and allows us to be open to new learning, which you can't do when you're actually shut down and hustling too much. Absolutely. doesn't sound woo-woo to me, but I agree. I used to be in my 20s, that person who would wake up and run out the door. And now with, uh, I also have two teenagers, it's just um, getting up and having some moments of quiet 
I, I think for me are important. And, and the days that I don't do that, do, these things can snowball. So it really, these little decisions of, um, you know, whether you're just going to uh, say a few things in the shower to calm yourself down or promise yourself you're not going to check the emails until you've listed three <laughs> grateful things. I mean, these little shifts can really turn, I like to say, your daily grind into a more sacred grind where you're just feeling better. Yes, I love that. I think that makes a ton of sense. So let, let me ask you about the holidays specifically. You found one in three Americans are feeling really stressed, even burned out between Thanksgiving and Christmas. This is supposed to be the season of peace and joy. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, I think what happens, though, is that we add on so many other things that whether it's social commitments, whether it's the fourth quarter of the year for a lot of people who are trying to hit their goals and, and finish out strong before the end of the year, um, those two things in, in working in tandem, I think, puts a lot of pressure on top of, of women in particular, but all of us. And then I think the other thing we have to be aware of is we've got two years of backlogged social activities where so many Thanksgivings or yeah. holiday seasons got canceled in the last two years that so many people are trying to make up for it this year and do all the things, all of the brunches, all of the volunteering, and it's a lot. So I think that's part of what we're finding out is that that burnout is at an all-time high anyway, but then when you add the extra from the holiday season, that tends to push people into a place where I'm hearing a lot of people say, I'm toast. I've got to stop here for a little bit and, and get a break. So how do you get off the holiday hamster wheel? So many people are married to their traditions of, well, this is what we've always done. Right. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes with actually being really honest with yourself and your great tip about checking in and being quiet is a real key there of looking at what your own expectations are and digging beneath it into why do you need to do that? Are you doing that thing because it's what's expected of you? Um, are you doing it because your family expects you to and it actually doesn't really work maybe for you and your spouse anymore? And really getting a sense of, you know, are you doing it for someone else? Or are you doing it for you is the first piece of that because I find so many people say, well, I don't want to let the kids down or my mom expects us to come. And when you actually wind up asking those people what they want and what those expectations are, often you'll find that people are open to new traditions and we're running on these, these old um, autopilot scripts that we're used to. So I think that's the first thing is just kind of making that space and checking in with yourself and your family members to find out what's really expected and, and what lights you up um, and, and really trying to balance that obligation with the things that are going to bring you energy this season. Yeah, and, and bringing energy might be the same as bringing joy. So just ask, maybe before you get into everything, you would like us to ask, like, what do I need right now? Or That's how? Right. what would it look like if I could have it my way? That's right. That's right. I think it's also, it's interesting. There's parallels between the workplace and home with this. In the work world, we're hearing, you know, a number of people say, I wish we could go back to the way it was. And then you're hearing a whole bunch of people say, this is the new normal. We better get used to whether it's flexible work or what have you. I think it's the same for our holiday traditions. This is a chance to write a fresh book in terms of what we'd like to do, how we want to spend our time. And I think if we can frame it to that, to the, like that, to the people that we live with or or celebrate with, we have a chance to really make new memories and new traditions in different ways that work for all of you. Yeah, if you are um, dealing with a boss at work, you specifically come from that corporate culture. And um, there are some bosses who are uh, back to like, okay, COVID's over, let's get back online, let's do everything. So uh, if you're someone who is very motivated, wants to do well at work, wants to be a good employee, but you have this boss that's stressing you out, how do you handle that, especially during this hectic time of the year? Yeah, I think part of that is understanding how much you can control in that situation, which is really difficult. Um, the reality is you can only control your own response to that. Um, and what you're going to do isn't necessarily going to change that person's behavior. But that's where those boundaries really come in of saying, yeah, I'm really excited to dig into this uh, project that we're working on. I'll be able to do this part now, but the rest of it I'm going to need to pick back up in January. And really setting those, uh, those expectations so that you're not getting that last minute call to do something right in the middle of a family holiday. And lastly, because you've done this, and I want to let everyone know again, your book, um, it was number one new release on Amazon. And uh, tell, tell everyone, can they find it at any um, any bookstore right now or just on Amazon? Uh it 
Yep. Amazon's the best place to go. It's coming to bookstores in the new year as part of our second leg of our book tour. And you can also find it on the website, which is corporate-rehab.com, where you can see the book. You can read some of the stories from some of the women that I feature in the book and get a little bit more information on uh, helping leaders thrive, which is what I do as corporate rehab as a company. Yeah. So corporate rehab, ditch the hustle culture and thrive again. Did you, you ditched your corporate life, I guess, and started your own I, business. So I did. Yeah. <laughs> some people maybe be dreaming of that, but may say, oh my gosh, that's even more stressful than what I'm doing right now. How do you bridge yourself from that dream you might have with the putting out the fires every day? Yes, um, that's a good question. I think that's the hard part with that one is just trying to make space for what I want this next phase to be. And for those of you that are thinking about that, I think my best tips on that is to kind of think about why you might want to leave. Is it because you're working, you know, getting away from a toxic workplace culture or boss, or is it that you're getting towards something? Is there something you've outgrown that you'd really like to do differently in this next phase of your life? And then ask yourself, why not? Um, why haven't you taken that leap before? And those two answers, I think, can give you a sense of whether you're holding yourself back from something or whether you're trying to grow into something. And I anchor myself in that all the time for all my new decisions in this new phase of my career, because there's so many great things I bring from my corporate world into being an entrepreneur, but there's also so many challenges and you have to kind of keep that, that fire lit and remember the spark of what actually made you fall in love with your job in the first place or what makes you want to change it moving forward. Yeah, and for some, I'm sure, a lot of people, what keeps them is the security. Well, I need that paycheck or I need that health care. And I know, uh, I think Maya Angela has a quote like, uh, never let the security, you know, ruin your dreams. She says it more eloquently, but that is a real factor. What's the first step for people who, I wish I could just go start this, but I can't. Yeah, I think that to your point, the security piece is huge. That was one of the things I found when I was researching the book, that if we think about back to high school to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that security layer is number one, right? And you have to get food and shelter. And, and that's a very real scenario for so many of us. So I, I want to acknowledge that that's a real thing. But on top of that, when you live in that for a long time or you're raised in that, often we can be running on these old stories that aren't even ours anymore. And maybe you are in a place where you can now take some risk or you can do this on the side while you keep your day job and think about bridging that gap. So really getting honest with yourself first about what do you really need to cover and how much of that is your responsibility versus other members of your household, I think is, is step number one. And then the second thing I always like to think about is really really thinking about what is feels what feels purposeful to you and know that that can change. You could be your why, like Simon Sinek says, but really grounding yourself and what are the things that feel meaningful. And about half the women that I coach actually wind up staying in their same job because they've been able to reconnect to some of the meaning and the roles they have. Oh. And then others are able to find other things, whether it's being an entrepreneur or going to a different company that better aligns with their values. But it really starts with you. It starts with reconnecting to what lights you up and, and taking responsibility for what part of that that you can control. And you mentioned coaching. So that's the other part of what you do if someone's listening and they need a coach. It might be a new word to some folks. Uh, a lot of people have heard of therapy. Coaching is maybe the step after that. But um, if you're worried, like, oh, how am I going to, right now I have a boss who keeps me accountable and sets my schedule. Um, I need someone to help organize this. I've got all these ideas, but I need to execute. Is that what a coach helps with? And, and, and what does that look like working um, with someone like yourself? Yeah. Um, so what I love about coaching is the answers are actually usually inside of you. And my job is just to help facilitate pulling them out. And so what that looks like is I've got coaching packages, working on leadership coaching, either for women who are in corporate America and want to get to the next level without burning out or for women who have left corporate America and are actually trying to scale their own companies or start their own companies. And I can bring that 20 plus years of experience of being a corporate executive to help more female founders have a secure footing and foundation as they start to scale their businesses. So it looks like a lot of one-on-one -on -one and group discussions, hearing from others who are trying to do the same thing. Um, because I think one of the biggest things that's important, whether you're in corporate America or outside, is being seen and really feeling like you're you're understood 
as uh, part of the same challenges and opportunities and you're not in it alone. Yeah. Well, and that can make all the difference for someone if you are trying to, I, I bring that out because sometimes you might have the best intentions, but you need that supportive culture. And if you don't have it in your own world and your own family, um, you know, bringing in an outside resource could make all the difference in your success and maybe telling you what you can cut out of your life that's draining you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. 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 Uh, so one more time, let folks know where they can see you. This might be a good time as you end the, the year to set some new goals for next year and ask yourself, what do you want everything to look like? And that, that might be, the, uh, you might need a little help and, and this book could get you there. So let everyone know where they can find the information again. Yes, happy to. So the book is, again, Corporate Rehab, Ditch the Hustle Culture and Thrive Again. We talk about moving from surviving into thriving in both your work and your life. And the book is available on Amazon in both Kindle and regular book format. And it's also on my website at www.corporate-rehab.com, along with all of the coaching and corporate speaking packages. So uh, really look forward to you checking it out. It makes a great holiday gift. Yeah, absolutely. You can help someone uh, find the scaffolding for their dreams. Okay, Jenny, thank you so <laughs> much for being here. We appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, Kara. I appreciate it. Yeah. And for those of you who want to find more information on the cutting edge of wellness, you can follow me on social media at Kara Sundlin. Join the Kara's Cures Facebook group. Uh, we love to share this content there. If it's inspired you and you want to help, uh, definitely pass this along. We appreciate your support. Have a great day, everyone, and be well.